Hi, I'm Chad Lawson. This is Tater Tot, and you're watching Verbose Mode. Hi, and welcome back to Verbose Mode, the show dedicated toward learning to learn and the freedom to fail. I'm your host, Chad Lawson. Today, we're going to talk about radiation. This became uh, extremely aware to me this recently. Our oldest dog, who you saw in the teaser, developed a tumor on his neck, a squamous cell carcinoma, and we were taking him to Madison, Wisconsin for the radiology lab there uh, for the treatment on this. And they have a particularly impressive machine, a tomotherapy machine that can combines both the radiation along with uh, some some imagery systems that allow them to be able to precisely down to the millimeter target uh, the cancer and not any tissue that one wants to keep alive. Uh, so after, I think it was either after the first or second of the therapy, the radiation therapy treatments, the doctor asked if we wanted to see the room and of course we did. And as we're going through the, the hallway, uh, I noticed that all of a sudden we get to this one section and something feels odd about the hall. And that's when I realized, we're not walking through a hall. This is actually the walls separating the radiation lab from the rest of the building. And when we got inside, we were able to see the tomotherapy machine. So now here's where you can see uh, the whole process. And in addition to the the level of precision they can get with the with the d the device, there is also the fact that uh, Tater had our our dog had a mold made of his mouth and a mold made of his body laying down while he was under anesthesia. So they were able to place him in a bed that cradled his body and a, a his mouth was put into a brace that then held him. So they were able to get him into the exact same position every time to be able to direct the energy where they needed it. But this began a very uh, interesting process for me because I didn't necessarily know that much about radiation and everything I knew really came from the horrifying things like the movies of the 80s, like war games and the most traumatizing of films the day after talking about a, a nuclear war. So coming up with the idea of radiation as a positive thing kind of stood out in my mind. And what was interesting to me was they talked about different approaches we could take for giving tater the radiation and they each had their pros and cons as far as effectiveness and possible side effects uh, one of the, the treatment program we went with uh, it it was four different treatments and the amount of radiation they were giving him uh, essentially would end up being his lifetime dosage meaning that if it hadn't done what we needed there wasn't going to be any going back to give him more radiation it would have been uh, as much as we could he could he could take. And it was they, the, the term they were throwing around was a unit called Graze. And so I did, like any, like any good geek, I did a little bit of looking online. This is from Wikipedia. I'll have all the links that you're going to see in our show notes. Uh, Graze talks about the, the impact of absorption of the body of radiation. What it doesn't talk about is the health effects, the actual, um, the possible side effects and so forth. And there's another unit, one that I was familiar with, uh, called Sieverts. Uh, a sievert is a unit of measurement that specifically talks about radiation's absorption into the body in terms of impact on your health. Now, if this all seems very confusing, confusing, that's because it is. There's plenty of other terms, including uh, RADS and GRAYS, I believe, or no, the GRAYS is the one I mentioned earlier. The, there was a number of different units that I've heard all of my life, these two being the most common. So what cracked me up when I was looking at different units and trying to get my head around them all was the banana equivalent dose. Uh, this refers to specifically as a term talking about radiation uh, coming from a banana, which is rated in 0 0.1. I'll have to, uh, I'll have to double check in a little bit. You can see it in here. I can't quite read it on that screen. As either being 0 0.1 or 0 0.01 sieverts uh, being given off from a banana, and the reason for that is because potassium, as we all know, bananas are very rich in potassium. Potassium is a or can be a radioactive element, and as it as as the element begins to break down, it gives off beta particles. And uh, specifically, then let's talk about not all radiation being equal. Uh, there is actually three main particles for radiation: alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha particles uh, are so incredibly 
uh, what's the word I want to look for? They're they're so incredibly um, safe, I guess is the best word, because they can be blocked by the, the dead layers of your skin. Uh, so they are going to hit your skin, a piece of paper, pretty much anything, and just immediately be blocked, and that's the end of it. So they're not a big risk. I should also specify the three types that I'm talking about here are ionizing radiation, meaning this is radiation that can impact the body, can damage cells, can damage cells' abilities to reproduce uh, and be healthy cells, and is also then used to try to damage cancerous cells. Uh, beta Beta particles, uh, uh, as found with potassium in a banana, can be blocked by very light things. Uh, I think it was small wood was one of the, simple wood was one of the things I saw, but also even an aluminum can will block a beta particle. Gamma, on the other hand, that's where that whole fear came from from my childhood, living, assuming during the 80s that we were all going to go to nuclear war that radi uh, gamma radiation is only slowed down by, as you can see in this picture, not actually stopped by concrete and lead. So that's why you were seeing that entire, those thick walls uh, around the, the machine for the, for the tomotherapy. But um, kind of to get your head around, because it becomes really scary thinking about radiation and we live around it all the particular time. Well, there's, not only are there different dose levels, uh, different types, you know, ionizing versus non-ionizing. But even if you're dealing with ionizing radiation, and even if you are dealing with beta and gamma particles, the amount the body can safely uh, take care of, absorb, and, and get rid of over time, uh, uh, that's really what one needs to think about. This graph is from a comic called XKCD. Uh, this, this particular graph shows every not every, but tons of different sources, examples of how much radiation from a given source and the impact on the body rated in sieverts. Uh, so that's that's another reason I keep coming back to that particular uh, unit of measure. Uh, Randall, McEnroe, Randall Monroe, who creates XKCD, is a brilliant scientist as well as just a funny, funny guy. I haven't met him personally, but if he's anything like his comics, I would love to meet him. He's, he's got a great sense of humor. And he, but he came up with this because the idea of the, one of the very first blue dots you see there is uh, radiation given off by the banana. And it expands from there, including having sections in the red and uh, the bigger sections, the green, talking about stuff like Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and so forth. Those long lasting impacts of radiation on health. And so it really kind of helps put it all into perspective using those little dots to put everything into perspective and show you that the world we live in while we are constantly being bombarded from radiation ultraviolet radiation which can give us a sunburn um, to the potassium coming out of our bananas there's just lots of sources of radiation that we are exposed to all the time that really aren't that dangerous um, it's it's a matter of how much absorption you get in a certain amount of time. So for me, this this became kind of an interesting process. What's the difference between the radiation that is being given to my dog and the radiation coming off of a banana, etc.? I wanted to know more about it. Uh, I started looking through like any any good geek. I started looking through sites like Adafruit and SparkFun to try to find a radiation detector, a Geiger counter. And I ended up finding out this one from MightyOm.com. I purchased it through Adafruit. It arrived, I, I bought this, um, I think it was right after Tater's second second radiation treatment. I bought this with the intention of uh, holding it up to Tater's neck both before and after the, the, the radiation treatment to see kind of any particular spikes. But even in my research, I had, I had started to, to realize this to be the case, uh, and it was brought home by one of the doctors that because there's no actual material being left in his neck, it is the, the ionizing radiation going through to hit the tumor and to break apart those cells, and it is just going through and through, there would would be no noticeable uh, impact on him. And that ended up being the case. I put this to Tater and no, there was nothing. But, but what was really good about this whole process from a learning experience was um, when I got this Geiger counter, put it together at two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, I wanted to have it ready for Tater's third treatment. And <laughs> that did not go according to plan. I got to put together because you should never be soldering something together at two o'clock in the morning when you have to be up in merely five hours. And I didn't do a good job. I was kind of rushed and put it all together and flipped the switch and nothing happened at all. I, I was doing some digging through MightyOm.com's forums 
trying to find out what could possibly be wrong. And I found another person had posted that they were having problems, that they that it hadn't come on. And uh, Jeff, I'm going to, sorry, Jeff, I'm going to slaughter this. Jeff Keezer, the creator of this particular board and the owner of MightyOm.com, had responded to him with some different test points, places to put your multimeter and detect what was the voltage here and here and find out where things broke down. And he had given him, I think, something like eight or nine different test points. I have them written down on my whiteboard around the corner. And I measured each of them for my own. And yeah, I came up with completely different results, including a lot of zeros. Nothing was flowing at that particular spot. So I posted my own results and Jeff got back to me asking for some uh, pictures of the front and back of my circuit board so we could see what was going on and he noticed a couple of my solder points looked uh questionable and they were because i soldered it two three o'clock in the morning and he gave me some suggestions on on what could possibly be wrong based on my units specifically uh what was neat is i was able to bring up his schematic he posts this freely available uh, under open source it even says right on here that this is creative commons the entire board that you see is Breaking, broken down into three basic sections. In the top left, you see the power the power systems, and that's what takes my three volts here using a 555 timer chip and some other components to take the three volts that comes out of two AA batteries, 1.5 volts per cell, and steps them up to some 200 plus volts. I want to say it's like 223, something in that range that I measured once it was working, once I measured across the, the Geiger tube to do that. Uh, the other section then, if you look at the top right of the schematic, has the sensors, or the, the actual Geiger tube itself. That's what you see here. Um, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then down in the bottom left is where we have our, our output. And this is being driven by an AT tiny chip. Uh, an Atmel tiny chip. It is the little brother of the At Mega chip that you will find in an Arduino. So this is a very familiar chip, very familiar to, to code. And Jeff has provided all the source code. So if I wanted, I could actually reprogram this chip. In fact, he's even broken out the programming. There's a ICSP header here, the same six pins that you'll find in an Arduino Uno for handling programming if you weren't going, if, if for some reason you bricked your Arduino, you could get through the ICSP and probably uh, still get at that chip. He also has then uh, the three pins here for detecting the pulse, uh, so being able to pull out the data for that. Oh, and in case you hadn't seen, I've got a nice little speaker and LED detect that uh, for a visual. But then I also have this nice little set of pins here that are labeled serial. So I'm able to connect up through uh, like an FTDI friend, one of those programming connections for uh, smaller Arduino clones that do not have their own USB programming. I'm able to connect one of those to this and pull directly in for serial data and read every time there's an impact based on it, it timestamps it provides the impact and so forth. So more than just a simple beep and and a flash of light, I can get a lot more information and pull it straight off of this board. So he's given us all this information, all the code, he's given us the schematic, and it's all in this really nice particular little process. But for me, what really made my, my experience with this board wonderful was the availability of Jeff through the forum to get the information I need because I didn't do it right. I, I made some mistake or mistakes and ended up having to uh, replace a component. It ended up being, and I'm going to try going back real quick. Uh, yeah, it ended up being what had gone wrong was one of these two transistors, and I can't recall which at the time, um, had had given up the ghost, uh, give, released its black smoke into the world, if you will. And it was my fault. I believe at some point I had powered up the circuit, and again, it was 3 o'clock in the morning, 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. I shouldn't have done it. I had powered up the circuit, and I heard some little click and beep, and then nothing. And what I think what had happened is I had left out one of the components. So when I put it back in, fired it on again, there was nothing. I had already done the damage. The transistor was was toast. Uh, so this has been a really great learning process for me about when not to be doing electronics late at night. But also, it's been a wonderful experience working with with Jeff through the forums, and it's a great product. Um, I want to talk about the the Geiger tube itself. This is actually what's called a Geiger Mueller tube. Uh, simply frequently shortened to Geiger tube. This is what detects the radiation. And what happens is uh, a radioactive particle, uh, either our beta or gamma particles, will 
come through the tube, which is very much like a fluorescent tube, if you want to think about it that way. And uh, there's essentially like a filament material inside the tube that is plucked like a string uh, when when radioactive when radioactivity is present and that's what causes uh, the reaction throughout the rest of the chip uh, this is actually just held in through a couple of clips so it's very much like being able to remove a bulb um, when I when the whole thing went wrong I honestly thought I had actually broken the tube to begin with so it's been a really neat learning process for me, learning a little bit about what my dog's been going through for his radiation treatment, learning a little bit more about the radiation all around us all the time, what's safe, what isn't. It's been a very uh, mind-opening experience, hopefully not anywhere near like this, uh, but it's been a fun learning process. So as always, if there's any particular, if there's any, you have any questions about this particular episode in terms of radiation or this circuit in particular, if you have questions about other episodes that you've seen, or if there's something you would like to see in a future episode, please let us know. Uh, you can find us on the web, verbosemode.tv, through Twitter, at TV, or on YouTube, simply search for verbose mode tv and uh, let us know what you think let us of this episode or uh, anything you'd like to see in the future if there's a project that's of curiosity to you let me know i mentioned the 555 chip that is on this that is part of the power portion of the circuit um, i love the 555 chip and i've got an entire episode dedicated to talking about that particular little clock pulse and it's how how fun it is and if there's more things along those lines you'd like to hear let us know until then, please let us know what you're making, and we'll see you next time.